Hi, welcome to another video. In this video, we have something very basic. We're going to talk about the properties and graphs of quadratic functions, how to kind of cope with this vertex form versus maybe just graphing the, the vertex and x-intercepts and y-intercepts that they work together just one time through to make sure that you're seeing it. This is a little more advanced in like an intermediate algebra class because our, none of these are going to be factorable for us very easily. Uh, so we need to find x-intercepts through quadratic formula. But basically just making sure you're ready to move on and graph some polynomials, which is pretty much the next thing that we're going to be starting. So here's the way that we go and graph quadratic functions. I need you to know a couple things about them. Number one, any quadratic, which is a polynomial of a second degree, so power two polynomial, this is the way they're all going to look. They are all going to be parabolas. If your a is greater than zero, they're going to be what we call upward opening. And if your a, the first coefficient of your x squared term, is negative, you're going to get a downward opening parabola. That's where they always look. If a is in absolute value larger than one, we get a vertical stretch either way, or if it's absolute value less than one, we get a vertical compression. It'll make the graph look more narrow or more wide, respectively, depending on whether your A in absolute value is greater than one or less than one. Uh, so we're going to be practicing that, and just kind of looking through these. Then we need to know how to find the y-intercept and the x-intercepts, and if we want to put this in vertex form or you're asked for it, how to do that with completing the square. So this is the process of going through graphing quadratics. We first determine whether this is going to be an upward opening or down opening parabola, just like what we talked about. Then we find the y-intercept, and the reason why we do those two first, the upward opening or downward opening give us a great way to check our work later, and in combination with the y-intercept, which every parabola has, we can determine if we need x-intercepts. So let me make that very clear to you. Every parabola is going to open either upward or downward. Every parabola is going to have a y-intercept. We're going to determine those two things. Every parabola has this vertex where you change from decreasing to increasing or increasing to decreasing. We're going to find that. What they don't always have are x-intercepts, if you have an upward opening parabola with a vertex above the x-axis, or a downward opening parabola with a vertex below the x-axis. And so we always go through our parabolas in the following thought process. Number one, is it upward or downward opening? Maybe we determine whether it's narrow or wide, depending on whether we have a vertical or, or a stretch or compression. Then we determine the vertex and the y-intercept. We're going to use the axis of symmetry to use the y-intercept to give us maybe a free point. And then if we need to, we determine x-intercepts. If not, we're done. And so we're going to go through that. We're going to talk about these, how we find the y-intercept by just plugging in 0 to our x, evaluating the function for x equals 0. It's always going to be your c. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about how when you find x-intercepts, this is exactly why we've been practicing the last few videos. We set our function equal to 0, and we use factoring, square root method, completing the square, or quadratic formula. Here, it's pretty much all going to be quadratic formula if we need to. And then, well, we we'll find the vertex one of two ways, either by completing the square, which I'm going to show you again, or by using uh, this vertex formula, which is so much nicer to use. So this is pretty much what we're going to do. I'm going to show you the order in which we go through it, and that's going to be just about it. We have maybe four examples I'm going to show you going backwards. If I give you a vertex and a wider set, how we make something in standard form. So let's take a look at our first, first function. It's clearly a quadratic. It's got that power two. There's three terms. They're in order. It looks really nice. Here's the order in which we graph parabolas. Number one, you have a choice to make. Either you're going to do completing the square, or you're going to find the vertex first, then the y-intercept, then the x-intercepts. In that order, and you graph them. Again, the reason why, because I don't, I don't want to hold you in suspense, this order works because every parabola is going to have a vertex, and every parabola is going to eventually cross the y-axis, but not every parabola make, has to cross the x-axis. And so we do this in order to save ourselves some work. If we find a parabola that has a vertex above the x-axis and we know it's upward opening, we don't have to wor worry about the x-intercepts. Or likewise, if we have them below, we don't have to worry about the x-intercepts. And so we go in that certain order to make certain we're not wasting our time finding x-intercepts that aren't even there. So let's go through it together. 
We know that's a parabola. We need to determine that because that 2 is positive and because that 2 is an absolute value greater than 1, this is going to be an upward opening parabola and it's going to be a little bit more vertically stretched, so, so a little narrower. What we're going to do first is find the vertex by this vertex formula. So vertex formula says if you can identify your A and your B and your C, which we should be really good at because of the quadratic formula, The vertex formula is going to give us that vertex. Now, here's how to find it. It looks really familiar because from the quadratic formula, if you remember, and you maybe watch that proof video again, this part was the piece that was here. before I take a square root. Now, why is that important? Because that's the only piece with an x in it, and this right here is in parentheses, and this means if I looked at it like a function, this would be a, like a shift left. That's what that would be as far as our function is concerned. And this, if I move to the other side, would be a shift up or down. That's what that's giving to you. Um, so where the vertex formula comes from is this idea that this is a shift left, hence the negative. And when we find out what that value is, that becomes the x-coordinate of our vertex. How to find the y-coordinate is once you find this x-coordinate that we're about to do, we plug it into our function. That's what this stands for. So going to our vertex, it says, hey, identify your a, b, and c. a is 2, and b is 8, and c is 5. Our vertex formula says take your negative b all over 2 times a, whatever your a is. In this case, our a is 2. We're going to simplify that, and then whatever value we find, we're going to plug it into our function. That's how points work, including the vertex. Every parabola has a vertex. We use the formula to find the x-coordinate, and then just like every ordered pair ever, we plug in the x or evaluate that x, and we get out the output. So we get out the y value, the y-coordinate, the f of x. It's the same thing as calling it y. So this we're going to leave blank for just a second. Uh, negative 8 over 4 is negative 2. And then we evaluate negative 2 in our function. So we know right now that our vertex is going to be negative 2 comma something along that negative 2 x value, some output. We have to plug in that negative 2 in order to find the output. So negative 2 squared is 4. 4 times 2, well, that gives us 8. 8 plus, let's see, 8 times negative 2 is negative 16. That would be negative 8, and plus 5 would be negative 3. So we evaluate this as negative 2, and then we get out negative 3. That is where our vertex is. Now, we're going to plot that. We're going to plot that as we go. So negative 2 comma negative 3 is this ordered pair. Negative 2, negative 3, right about there. That's our vertex. Now, think about this. This is an upward opening parabola. So if you are asked to find the minimum of this parabola, which you're going to be asked to do on some of the word problems you're going to get. What's the minimum of this, this function? If this is an upward opening parabola and this is the vertex, then your minimum right now, you're done. Your minimum value of this function is negative 3. It's not negative 2. That's the x value where it happens. Your negative, the negative 3 is the minimum height that this function attains. That's the idea of having a vertex being the maximum for a downward opening or minimum for an upward opening. So again, we've now we said, hey, this is a parabola. We know it's going to be upward opening. Your vertex is going to be the minimum value on that function, on the graph of that function, the height that it attains. Minimum value is negative 3. We know we can find a y-intercept, an x-intercept, and a vertex by using some of these techniques we've learned already. Y-intercept's really easy. X-intercept, we're using one of those techniques we learned about solving quadratics. And the vertex has a formula we just used negative b divided by 2a. We figure that out, we plug it into our function, we get an ordered pair that represents your vertex. Your y-intercept should be really quick. The y-intercept occurs where you plug in 0 to your x. So if we plug in 0, hey, that's going to be 0, and that's going to be 0. Can you see that if you evaluate your function for 0, you are only going to be left with the c value? If your function is in standard form, it means it looks like this. Then if you plug in 0, these things are gone. You're just going to get your c value, and that's what happens. It should take about five seconds to find this at most. So we know that our y-intercept is 0, 5. We're going to plot that next. 
And now we're going to determine something. You see, I gave you an, an order of steps so that we could identify whether or not we need to find x-intercepts or not. So right here, because we know it's upward opening, because we have a vertex, and because we know where our, our y-intercept is, are we going to have to cross this x-axis in this parabola? So here's our vertex. We know it's upward opening. Yeah, we're going to have to cross this somewhere probably somewhere between here and here, of course, because it's got to be symmetrical. We're going to have to cross that. That right there tells you whether you need to continue to find x-intercepts or not. Had our, had our vertex been above the x-axis and we were still upward opening, we wouldn't have to do this next step. So, to make it very clear, when you're graphing parabolas, we always find the vertex, no matter what. We always find the y-intercept, no matter what. We always use the y-intercept for a free point. I'm going to show you in just a second. But then sometimes we find x-intercepts if we have to. Vertex below the x and upward opening? Yes. Vertex above the x and downward opening? Yes. But not if we're above and upward or below and downward. I hope that makes sense to you. So here we're going to find in just a minute. But before we do that, I need you to understand that every parabola is symmetrical. And because it's symmetrical, We have this thing called an axis of symmetry, and it's always going to go through your vertex. So our graph is going to be this mirror image across that dotted line. What that means is this. If you have any point on one side of that axis of symmetry, you can mirror that image on the other side being equal distance from it. So because this five is, let's say, two units away from the axis of symmetry, this is negative two comma five is where that would, this point right here is. Because this y-intercept is two units away, we can go two units away on the other side at negative four five and put a point. So we know that that's symmetrical. Here's two units away from the axis of symmetry. The other side of that axis of symmetry is going to create for us another point. This is very, very helpful in your graphing. You get a point for free. That's really nice. We can always do that with our y-intercept, provided the axis of symmetry isn't on the y-axis. So we're always going to. We're always going to graph the vertex. No problem. We're going to graph the y-intercept. Great. We're going to use the axis of symmetry that always goes through your vertex to give ourselves a mirror image from where that y-intercept is. And then, if we need to, we're going to find x-intercepts. So how we find x-intercept is always setting your function equal to zero. And then trying to factor, or trying the square root method, trying something. Here, the square root method is not going to work. Uh, we can't get a power 2 by itself. It contains all of our x's and have a constant on the side. That, that's not happening. Could we do the uh, completing the square? Yeah, we can. And I'm going to do that in a minute to show you that we, we can solve it that way. Um, people generally think it's a little bit more work and unnecessary, but I want, I want to practice it to show you that it does work. If you're asked to do vertex form, that's what you have to do. Instead, if, if we can't factor, let's see, uh, 8, add to 8, multiply to 10, that, that's not going to happen. So man, uh, the only thing we got is quadratic formula. And that's going to happen in, in, at this level, where you can't factor to get x-intercepts. There's no way. But you know that they exist. So when we set this function equal to 0 and nothing else works, and we don't want to complete the square, do the quadratic formula. So identify your a and your b and your c, which you've already done. And we understand that our x would be equal to negative b plus or minus this whole b squared minus 4 times a times c. We've done this before all over 2 times a, and say, hey, our 8 is b, our a is 2, and our c is 5. And we end up getting this, I'm going pretty quickly here, but we want to make sure that we're not making any mistakes. Ah, ironic, because I forgot something. And it's 64 minus uh, 40, that's 24, all over 4. So negative 8, we have 64. We have minus uh, 40, that's going to be 64 minus 40 is 24, all over 4. What this ends up being is something that is an exact solution. I mean, we know we have x-intercepts. There's no i's here. We know we're crossing x, but it's very hard to graph. And so we're going to approximate it. And we're going to say, all right, once we take this negative 8 plus the square root of 24 over 4, negative 8 minus the square root of 24 over 4, notice what I'm not doing. 
I'm not spending a whole lot of time simplifying this by factoring out that square root of 4 and simplifying with 8 to 4. I don't care. Because all I'm trying to do here is approximate my x-intercepts. I'm trying to get a number that I can actually graph. And so that's what we're going to do. So after taking a break and, and work on this on your calculator or whatever, uh, I got that our x-intercepts are about, so I'm going to change this to uh, about equal to negative 3.22 and negative 0.77. Let's see if that kind of copes with what we got here. Negative 3.22. Negative 1, negative 2, negative 3.22. And then negative 0.77. Negative 0.77. Negative 0.77. Here's what we want to check. Because we have this nature of symmetry for every parabola, in fact, we use it to get a free point for a y-intercept, we want to make sure that our x-values, our x-intercepts, are also symmetrical on this graph, so that the same distance from the axis of symmetry on both sides, and this is, the only reason why this is a little bit off is because of a rounding error. Um, that's, that's the idea. So, man, once we have that, those five points are what we need to make a really solid graph for a parabola. We have determined that every parabola has a vertex. Find it first. Use the formula. Use the formula I've given you. Find the x value, plug it in for the y value. Plot it. Then find your y-intercept. Plot it. Use the asymmetry to give you a free point. Plot it. Determine if you need x-intercepts. If you're going to be crossing the x-axis, you've got to find them. Sometimes that means when we set this equal to zero and it's not factorable, we're using the quadratic formula. Plug in this into our calculator. Negative 8 plus square root of 24, and then divide by 4. Negative 8 minus square root of 24, and then divide by 4. Getting two values plotting them on our x-axis and double-checking they're the same distance from the axis of symmetry. After that, we have something that we can graph with a nice, smooth, flowing curve. Make it as symmetric as possible. And that's about as good as I can do by hand, to be honest with you. I hope that makes sense, the idea that parabolas are these, these shapes we get for, for quadratics. Uh, they're all going to make that. I hope it makes sense that if your A is positive, we're upward opening, and negative, we're downward opening. And then we have a vertical stretch of compression. This one is stretched a little bit. You can see it's a little more narrow than normal. I hope you understand that every parabola has a vertex. We're going to find it first. If it's below the x-axis and upward opening, you're also going to have x-intercepts, so we've got to be, keep that in mind. If it's above the x and downward opening, again, you're going to have x-intercepts, so we've got to keep that in mind. Every problem has a y-intercept. They're easy to find. We just plug in 0, we get our 0, comma c. X-intercepts might take some work here because they're not always factorable. Quadratic formula is going to give us an exact representation for our x-intercepts, but to graph them, we might have to approximate it. That's got to be there before you go any further. Now, one more thing that we can do. If, you've, if you're asked to put this in vertex form, or if you just want to double check to make sure that you got this right, I mean, I wouldn't <laughs> I would trust this, uh, but if, if you have to, we can always complete the square to verify our vertex. This is called vertex form because of the nature of the quadrant of the completed square, putting this in the, the form of uh, being able to use transformations, the, the shifting up, down, left, right. This is also the reason why I taught completing the square the way that I did, the way that we didn't work on both sides of our equation. So I want you to understand that when you complete the square, on a function like this, what you're doing is putting this in what's called vertex form. So we're going to do it. We don't need to set this equal to zero because I taught you the way we did. So let's go through it one time uh, on this example and one time on that example to make sure that we have this down and we're not going to touch it again for a real long time. So what completing the square does, it says, hey, I need my a to be 1. I'm going to factor out my a from these two terms. I'm not going to touch the last term. In fact, I'm going to kind of ignore it, not forget it, but ignore it. I'm going to leave myself a space right here, and I'm going to complete this. I'm going to add something here that makes this a perfect square. What we're doing, basically, is understanding that when we complete this square, we need a, we're, we have a messy number. We need a number that two numbers add to this middle one and two numbers multiply to this last number. We're going to be adding this number in here. But we also want it to be a perfect square, so we want these two numbers to be the same. 
So we think, what two numbers are the same that add to 4? It's got to be 2 and 2. Those are the only two numbers in the world that add up to 4 and are the same number. So what number are we missing? Well, we're missing the number that these two would have to multiply by. We're missing a 4. If I add that 4, it completes this factory and it says this will eventually factor as x plus 2 times x plus 2 or x plus 2 squared. That's what's going to happen there. That completes this factoring. The only problem is what we've done is we've added 4 inside of a parentheses, but more than that, something that has a 2 as a factor that's being multiplied by it. So in adding that 4, it wasn't there before, we added it on there. In adding that 4, we really increase this function by 8. Distribute the 2, you're increasing the function by 8. We have to undo that. We added 8, and then we subtracted 8 to make up for it on the same side of our function. That's why I taught this to you, the completing the square to you this way, because we don't have a 0, we don't have another side of your equation to compensate for that. We're all working on one side of the function here. If we combine some like terms, this is minus 3. The 2 stays right up front, and so our function says, hey, if you wanted to put this in vertex form, here's what this says. Oh man, I hope you remember our transition. This is pretty cool. This says, this is a parabola. How do you tell? Oh, it's power 2. What's going to happen here? You're going to shift down 3. Wait a minute. Down 3, 1, 2, 3. You're going to shift left 2. Remember how everything inside your parentheses is opposite what we want. So the inside says left or right, but plus 2 would be left 2. Left 2, oh wait, we see our axis symmetry. That's pretty neat. Uh, we know that this is going to be narrow. In fact, if we use our key points, these are things we've covered already, and we understand that I take these key points and multiply the outputs, the outputs of them by 2. That's 1, 2. That's 0, 0. That's negative 1, negative 2. I'm sorry, negative 1, positive 2. So from here, this would be uh, 1, 2. There should be a point there. Hey, there is. Negative 1, 2. There should be a point there. There is. Oh my gosh, that's symmetrical. That's what our key points would have done by, by doing this whole uh, transformations idea, doing the, the vertex form. If we wanted to find x-intercepts, you could set this equal to 0. You can add 3, divide by 2, take a square root, and then subtract 2. And if we look at that as, um, well, if we, let's see, we add 2, yeah, divide by 2, sure, take square root, plus or minus, and subtract 2. If you evaluate that on your calculator, you're going to get the same exact x-intercepts as this. If we wanted to simplify this a little bit, uh, yeah, we'd have to find a common number that's going to not be great, but we could certainly have done it. Uh, this would be negative 2 plus or minus square root of 6 over 2 if we rationalize the denominator. This right here, if we simplify, Negative 8 plus or minus 2 root 6. Hey, that's a square root of 4 times 6, all over 4. And we simplify. 2 goes into 8 4 times, into 2 1 time, into 4 2 times. And that's negative 4 plus or minus square root of 6 over 2. So why do they look different? This is written as two fractions. So if I separate this, negative 4 over 2 plus or minus square root of 6 over 2, this is negative 2 plus or minus square root of 6 over 2. It's the same exact thing. It's representing the same exact x-intercepts. If you wanted to find the y-intercept, you'd have to plug in 0 or go back to your original and say it's still going to be 0, 5. My idea here is just to tell you that this stuff all works together. So whether you want to do the vertex form uh, and complete the square, no problem. You can still use key points. You can find x-intercepts. You can find a y-intercept. Uh, you can find uh, the vertex very easily. This is down 3, left 2. This says down 3, left 2. That's exactly the same thing. You're talking about the same vertex. Uh, the, the minimum height is still negative 3. The maximum height is infinity. This goes on forever. We can find x-intercepts either way. We can find y-intercepts either way. It's really up to you. Now, which way do most people prefer? Most people prefer this one because you don't have to touch completing the square. 
because this gets really difficult if I didn't give you easy numbers. I gave you easy ones here. I gave you eight, which was divisible by two, and that created a four, which you can separate divide that by two very nicely. So if that's not the case, this becomes fairly challenging. We saw that when I taught you how to complete the square. So anyway, I hope that I've made sense to you on this example. This is the longest one we're going to go through. Later uh, on the on the rest of them, we're going to do basically this. I'm going to very quickly complete the square to verify the vertex and just to practice that a little bit. And then that's it. So at this point, we need to understand the vertex comes first. Every, every, every parabola has got it. we got to find it. The y-intercept comes second, every parabola's got it, we gotta find it, and we have to use it across from the axis of symmetry to find our symmetrical point. Then if we're gonna cross the x, then we find x-intercepts. So we're gonna come back and go on another, another example in just a second. Okay, let's continue. So we're looking at g of x, we have negative two x squared minus four x plus two. The first thing we gotta notice is, well, what's its shape? Its shape is, it's got a power two, that's the largest power, it's a polynomial type function, this is going to be a parabola. Now, is it going to be upward opening or downward opening? Because that's an order, it's really easy to identify that this is negative 2 in front of the x squared. It's going to make it a downward opening and fairly narrow parabola. It's going to be uh, this vertical stretch because the absolute value of our a is more than 1. So that's a little bit stretched out. Here's what we're going to practice. We're going to go through and find the vertex first, then our y-intercept, then our x-intercepts if we have to. Then I'll show you the vertex form if you need to find that, and we'll, we'll just make sure that they're giving us the same thing. So let's start with vertex. Because every parabola in the world has a vertex, this formula comes in really handy. Our formula for the vertex says we're going to find, based on our ABC, A being negative 2, and B being negative 4, and C being positive 2, we're going to find negative B, all over two times a. You gotta be real careful with signs. I oftentimes will use parentheses here to represent the sign, uh, to represent the, uh, the fact that we need to have that negative and it maintains operation. So negative b is negative negative four. All over two times a, that's two times negative two. We can't forget those negatives. We're gonna simplify it. So negative negative four, the opposite of negative four, that's positive four, but we're divided by negative four. That's negative one. Now to find the y value, we're gonna take that negative one, we're gonna evaluate it, put right back in g of x to find the y coordinate. So when we plug in negative one, let's see, uh, negative one squared is one, times negative two, that's negative two, minus four times negative one, so negative two plus four, well that's two, plus two is four. And we're gonna take that vertex and we're gonna plot it right now. So negative one comma four. Negative one comma four. Right about there. And we're gonna determine something right now. Because this vertex is above the x-axis and because it's downward opening, in our heads right now we're thinking, I'm gonna to have to find x-intercepts or at least an approximation for them. So I'm probably gonna be factoring, I'm probably gonna do a quadratic formula because my vertex is above the x-axis and it's downward opening. It's, the parabola is gonna cross it. We gotta find that. Well, tell me don't, is what if this had been upward opening? Hey, man, that we're golden. We don't have to find x-intercepts at all. Uh, the other thing we're going to talk about right now is the maximum. Because this is a downward opening parabola, that vertex represents the maximum height of your parabola, of this function. So if you were asked, hey, this, this is a, a picture of a, a ball going up and coming down, which it's not, let's just kind of how would you find the maximum height? Well, you'd find the vertex. So you wouldn't even do any of this if that was your question. Just find the vertex. The maximum height of a downward opening parabola happens at your vertex. So your maximum height would be four. It occurs at x equals negative one, but your maximum height would be four. That's the highest value that this function attains, the highest y value that you get is four on this. All right, so we know that. We know that every parabola is got a y-intercept. So we take like two seconds to say, if I evaluated for x equals zero, my y value is gonna be two. And I'm gonna plot that. Right now, before I forget, I'm gonna make sure that because I have that axis of symmetry, that always goes right through my vertex. 
I'm going to use that y-intercept to give myself a symmetrical point. So I know that at this 2, at this value of 2, I'm at 0, 0,2 there. I know that's one unit. This is negative 1. One unit away from an axis symmetry. If I go one more unit at the same height, but on the opposite side of that axis symmetry, I'm going to have another point due to the fact that this is an even function, well, based on the axis symmetry. It's a symmetric function about that. So we found the vertex, no problem. We know we're going to have x-intercepts, we're going to find them right now. We find our y-intercept, we use axis symmetry, we know it's downward opening, and now because of that, we know this is going to cross the x-axis. So we're going to do two things. We're going to, use, we're going to set this function equal to zero and find the x-intercepts, and then we're going to determine whether our approximation is accurate in equal distance from that axis symmetry. So we set this equal to zero. You know, we can't forget that we can do nice things, like if that's set equal to zero, we can try to factor, at, at least set it up for factoring, because it also helps our quadratic formula by having smaller numbers or at least less negative numbers. So what I mean by that is, don't forget that when you're, when you're finding x-intercepts, it doesn't care if your first term is positive or negative, it doesn't care about the signs of it. If you reflect this function, don't do it now, or don't do it over, over here like before, but if you do it now, your x-intercepts won't change. And so what we would do is we'd factor this. Let's factor out negative 2. That at least gives us something nicer to look at for factoring. Now when we think about it, man, it looks like it should be factorable. But we can't add to positive 2 and multiply to negative 1. That's, that's not going to happen for us. And so our best choice here, because factoring is not going to work, I really don't want to do completing the square right now. Um, the quadratic formula is pretty much it. Our a would be 1, our b is 2, and our c is negative 1. So x equals negative b plus or minus, we got a square root, b squared minus 4ac all over 2a, then we fill it out. b comes first, a comes second, c comes last. I know that we have x equals negative 2 plus or minus square root of 8 all over 2. Can you simplify it? Yeah, you sure can. Do you have to? It depends. If you're asked for an exact answer, then yes. You'd want to simplify this as the square root of 4 times 2, so 2 root 2. And then we can simplify by factoring or understanding the reason why factoring works and simplifying all three of these coefficients or constants, as the case may be. And you get negative 1 plus square root 2 and negative 1 minus square root 2. That's almost easy enough for us to approximate our head if you know the square root 2 is 1.41. Uh, so if we do that, well, we go, okay, negative 1 plus 1.41. is approximately 0 0.41. And negative 1 minus 1.41 is negative 2.41. That's what we're going to put on our x-axis, as, as close as we can. So let's see, negative 1, negative 2.41, negative 1, negative 2.41, and then 0 0.41, that's positive. Man, that looks about right. That's 1.41, 1.41 on each side of the axis symmetry. So I know that we're symmetrical. That's probably a really good indication we got this right. And now we're going to graph our parabola using those five points. As symmetric as possible using the vertex, y-intercept second with the axis symmetry free point, and then your x, uh, well, your x-intercepts if you have them. Now, I did promise you that I was going to do completing the square, just to make sure that we have that right. If you have to do vertex formula, here's what we would do. So for our g of x, remember we don't have two sides to work on, and so that's why I showed you how to complete the square the way that I did. Because if you don't have that other side, you can't compensate for what you're adding for or subtracting on another side of an equation. There's not one. You have to do it on the same side. So rather than teach two different ways, I choose to teach you the way that I do. That way you have one way that works all the time. What we have to do here is separate our first two terms 
and our constant at the very far back. We don't want to lose it, but we want to ignore it for a second. And we're going to divide out or factor out a negative 2. It's going to change your signs. We're going to complete this so that it's factorable. We're missing a number right now. Just think about what you would have to put here to make the factoring actually work. It's got to be a 1. So I want this to work as far as being a perfect square trinomial. It would be missing a 1 in order to make that happen. I'm thinking, hey, i got to add a 2. What numbers add a 2 that are the same? 1. What, do those have to, what does this have to be for those to multiply to it? It would have to be 1. That's the value I'm missing. The problem is this. By, excuse me, by taking and, <clears throat> excuse me, by adding that 1, you are, distribute this. By adding that 1 inside of something that has a factor in front of it, you're technically subtracting 2. Negative 2 times 1 is negative 2. You actually uh, subtracted 2 from the value of this function. You're going to undo that. So because you added 1 inside of a parenthesis which has this factor in front of it, if you add 1 here and distribute that 2, what you really did is you subtracted 2 from that function. You've got to add 2 to undo that. So what I tell students is distribute and then undo whatever that distribution tells you. So this distribution says negative 2, we want to add 2, we want to undo that. That means that our function is, we know that that's going to factor, it's right here. You complete this so that it would factor. As x plus 1 squared, we've got this negative 2 and then we have this plus 4. This says your parabola should be shifted up 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. Should be shifted left 1. Remember inside, plus means left. That's where a vertex is. That's why this is called vertex form, because you can easily find your vertex by thinking about the shifting. Up 4, that's a y value. Left 1, that's an x value. That's why it's called vertex form. We know it's a parabola. We know it's downward opening. We could have used key points. This would be uh, 1, comma, negative 2 from here. 1, negative 2, and 1, negative 1, negative 2. We get the exact same points as we got before. But the drawback is this is a little harder to find x-intercepts from. You have to set it equal to 0, subtract 4, divide by negative 2, take a square root, and then subtract 1 and approximate. But you would get the same thing. So that's the idea behind going through this uh, one of those two ways. Either we're finding vertex, then y-intercept, then x-intercepts if necessary, or we're finding the completing the square process with vertex form, kind of doing the same idea. I hope I've made this make sense. I hope that you see this completing the square as something that's not super duper scary, uh, but something that is giving you the same stuff as this. You see, the, the, one of the problems is in teaching is that we think these are all like not meshed together. I need you to understand that whether you're doing this or this, you're finding the same thing. Completing the square gives you the vertex. Vertex formula gives you the vertex. Y-intercept, you can still find it. Plug in 0, you get 2. Plug in 0, you get 2. Or plug in 0 here, you get 2. X-intercepts, well, I would say that this way is easier because you have the quadratic formula. Or you complete the square, which is where the quadratic formula comes from anyway. So I'm, I'm telling you, you're doing the same thing. It's just a different way to get there. So um, on the next couple examples, we're not going to go through the, the whole vertex form. This is only if you need it or if you just really enjoy doing it or want to practice it. So at this point, we need to be very comfortable with vertex, finding that, with the y-intercept, using that, and then finding x-intercepts of quadratic formula and approximating our calculators. So I'll be right back with a couple more examples. Okay, let's go ahead and finish up our last two examples of graphing just to make sure that we understand the process, that we don't always have to find x-intercepts. Then I'll show you one way to go backwards. I'll give you a vertex and a y-intercept and show you how to get a function like that from it. So, Number one, uh, f of x, negative 4x squared minus 4x minus 1. We should all know at this point that that's a parabola and that that is a downward opening and really narrow parabola, really, uh, because that negative 4 is going to stretch this thing out. Absolute value of negative 4 is 4. That's it's a lot bigger than 1. It's going to be very narrow. Um, also, what we have is this negative, which says that it's downward opening. Now, we're going to go through. We're not going to complete the square. We're going to do this the vertex, y-intercept, and then maybe x-intercept way if we can. So with our vertex, we got to be really good at identifying a, b, and c. And also, I want to make sure that you understand this. You've seen me change some signs from time to time. That only works when you have this set equal to zero to find x-intercepts. We can't go and change signs now before finding the vertex and y-intercept. That's why we do the x-intercepts 
last. Otherwise, we start making these signs change and then we have a, a different opening parabola. That's not okay. The only reason why we can change signs for x-intercepts is if you reflect a function about the x-axis, change the signs, the x-intercepts themselves don't change because they're on the thing that you're reflecting about. They can't change signs because they're signless. That will put a zero for those x-intercepts. So we don't change signs until we get to here. So for our vertex, we all right. Our A has to be negative four, our B is negative four, and our C is negative one. That's the numbers that we gotta use to find the vertex. So we're gonna do negative negative four, two times negative four. We're gonna leave that open for just a second so that we understand we're gonna evaluate our function for that x value in order to find our output or our y value or y coordinate. So uh, that's positive four, that's negative eight, that's negative one half, which gets kind of awkward when you start evaluating functions for fractions. I'd recommend your calculator, just take it, use your fraction button, so that way we don't, we don't make a simple error. Uh, you probably can do that in your head, but double check your work at least uh, with a calculator because it's really awkward to put that vertex down here and then use a y-intercept that's, that's correct with a vertex that's not. It's not going to look very good for you. You're not going to get a nice parabola. So with negative one-half, uh, negative one-half squared is positive one-fourth times negative four. Well, that's negative one. And then we have this negative four times negative one-half. Well, that's positive two. So negative one plus two minus one is zero. Well, it's zero. Well, that's weird. What in the world does that mean? Well, we know that's a vertex, and every parabola has got a vertex. Let's plot the vertex. Remember, it's a vertex at negative one half zero. Negative one half zero is right there. That's negative one half comma zero. Now think about this. This is the vertex, which means it's the highest point of a downward opening parabola. If this is the highest point, can this parabola ever cross the x-axis again? No, it can't. We know this. Because if you have a vertex that's sitting on that, that x-axis, you have found the only x-intercept. It's a double root. And if we had gone down to x-intercepts and solved this equal to zero, we're going to find negative one-half twice. If you want to try it, try it. Try factoring it. Try doing whatever you want. It's going to work. It's going to factor. Um, but you'd get... Uh, protein in a minute if you really want. Um, so that, that right there, that, that vertex that says, you don't have to do x-intercepts right now. You've found the only x-intercept that you're ever going to have for this function. What you do have to do is find your y-intercept. If we evaluate 0, we're going to get negative 1. I know that 0, negative 1 is our y-intercept. Notice how narrow that makes it. If that's our vertex and that's our next point, that's a really, really narrow parabola. Now, what do we do with it? Well, we know that the axis of symmetry goes right through the vertex. So if I'm a one-half unit away from my axis of symmetry here, I can go one-half unit on the other side and find a symmetrical point. This is what we would use to graph our parabola. Now, do we have to continue? Do you have to find the x-intercepts? No, it's irrelevant. You've already found it. So that's what we do is in order. Every parabola has a vertex. Sometimes you're going to find the x-intercept here. Every parabola has got a y-intercept. Use it to find a symmetrical point. But if we, only, if we understand what this looks like, a downward opening parabola, it matches that. It's narrow. It's downward opening. There's not going to be any additional x-intercepts. Don't waste your time. The only thing that might make this a little better is to go one more unit outside of what you have. What I mean by that is you might want to plug in a value like negative 2 or here's 0. Plug in a value like 1. If I plugged in 1 and I plugged in negative 2, I'd have two additional points that would be symmetrical. Or plug in 1 and use symmetry, that's fine too. Uh, but that would give me a better shape of this thing. So I hope that makes sense to you. For, for me, I mean, this is clear enough that we know that's pretty narrow. But you might want to go ahead and plug in two more points here. either Or one more point use symmetry. So we're going to do this. get as good of a parabola as we can out of it. And if you want to see the x-intercepts, if you plug this, or set this equal to zero, and you change all your signs, because we can now, because equal to zero doesn't really matter. We're talking about x-intercepts. If you reflect x-intercepts, they don't do anything. They, they stay the same. 
we get positive 4x squared plus 4x plus 1. This factors, actually. But you divide by your a, and you'd say, oh, my x-intercepts are, remember this, change your sign, negative 1 half and negative 1 half. You have an x-intercept at negative 1 half. That's exactly what we found. And there's only one. It's a repeated root. It's a double root. Multiplicity 2 says your function is bouncing off the x-axis. That is what I want you to understand. And I hope I've explained it well enough that you do understand that. So we're going to go on to the last example. As far as graphing is concerned, it's going to be very quick. And then we'll talk about what I told you going backwards. All right, so let's take a look at g of x. We have 3x squared plus 2x plus 5. In your head right now, I need you to be thinking that's a parabola. I need you to understand that it's upward opening because we have that positive 3, and it's fairly narrow. Because that three, it's not as narrow as this one was, but it's a little bit more narrow than a 2, a little bit less narrow than a 4. We're going to go ahead and find the two things that this graph is going to have. It's going to have a vertex because they all do. It's going to have a y-intercept because they all do. But this is not going to have any x-intercepts. I want to show you how to deal with it. So for our vertex, if we identify our a, which you should, maybe try it right now. Our a is 3, and our b is 2, and our c is 5. So we put negative b, that's negative 2, all over 2 times a, that's 2 times 3. Uh, that gives us negative 1 third, which is kind of awkward. Now, if we evaluate that, that's the only way we find points in functions, is to evaluate them or understand the function, which we're learning about right now. So if we evaluate for negative 1 third, man, negative 1 third squared, uh, that's 1 ninth. And then a third of that, it was three times that, is one third again. Okay, well, then two times negative one third is negative two thirds. One third minus two thirds, well, that's negative one third, plus five is four and two thirds. And so you do that, or you use your calculator, and you get the same thing. You might get an improper fraction, that's fine too. Let's see, 14 thirds uh, would be, oh, yeah, would be okay. Now, can we graph that? Can we plot it? Sure, it's a little awkward, but where our vertex occurs is, let's say this is negative 1. Then negative 1 third comma 4 and 2 thirds. There's 1, 2, 3, 4, and 2 thirds. Negative 1 third. Probably right about there. I'm going to have to adjust my graph a little bit more because of this. Oh, maybe not. It's just going to be kind of awkward. That's where our vertex is. Now think. You just, you, you hopefully said in your head that this is upward opening. If it's upward opening and your vertex is way up here, is this ever going to cross your x-axis? Ever? N no. This, this is, there are none. If you want to do the quadratic formula, oh man, I hope this makes sense. What's your discriminant going to be? Is it going to be positive, negative, or zero? If this doesn't have any x-intercepts, your discriminant would have to be negative. This would give you two complex solutions here, saying you are not crossing the x-axis. That's what's going to happen if you try to find x-intercepts. So we're not going to, since that we're doing something practical. We're, we're actually graphing this. So we don't, we're not going to have any x-intercepts. We're not even going to try to find them because we understand this is upward opening. Vertex is above the x-axis. In fact, our y-intercept, which is 0, 0, 0, 5, is right here. Now, this is kind of awkward because we don't have a lot of room to notice the curve of this graph. So if you use the act as a symmetry, which is fine, this is a third of a unit from, remember this is negative one third. That's a third of a unit away from the, the y-axis. The y-axis is a third of a way. Where that, uh, that y-intercept is, is a third of a unit away from the, the axis symmetry. If we go another third of a unit, so like at negative two-thirds, we plot another point. Use our symmetry and use our knowledge of the fact that this is going to be quite narrow to give ourselves that upward opening problem we know we're going to get. What would make this better is to use some values outside of your y-intercept. So I would use something like negative one and maybe positive one. Uh, they're not going to give you symmetrical points here because they're not spread evenly from that negative two third, negative one third. 
but it would be a little bit better than nothing. So plug in a couple points here to get that, that nice look to your graph. That's where I'm gonna leave you. I'm gonna leave you just with the understanding of what the vertex does that you need at first, line intercepts second, and then you might not even have to do X intercepts and how to deal with that. So I hope that that's made sense. I'll come back with one more very quick example. Okay, so sometimes you're asked to find a function given some information, like in this case, uh, you got a vertex and you have a line intercept and says find the function. How in the world do I do that? Really by understanding how your functions work in what's called vertex form, which I've talked a lot about in this video in the first two examples. So what we're gonna do here is twofold. Because we have one, two, three missing parts, three missing values, and one, two, three missing, or three given values, we're gonna use those to fill this function out. Here's the way that we do it. Number one, take your vertex, and fill out what your vertex would do as far as your shifting is concerned. Think shifting, think transformations. Think that if I have a X coordinate of one, that's a shift right one, and this minus five would be a shift down five. This is a shift right one down five. Represent that first. Then what we do is use the fact that a Y intercept of negative three is zero comma negative three. That's a point, that's gotta be a point. That's why we used points in everything we've done so far. Use that point to fill out what your A is gonna, uh, what your A is gonna be. And so I'm gonna show you how to do that right now. So if you have a vertex of one negative five and you go, well, listen, that, that one, that really means that we have a shift left one and we have a shift down five. Then instead of having X plus H and this plus K, I know that this function is gonna be something like this. A, I don't know yet, but I know a shift left, I'm sorry, a shift right, I said left, um, a shift right one is X minus one. That represents a shift to the right of one unit. Since this, this vertex says I shift right one and down five, that right one is a minus one. Do you remember that? Do you remember that everything inside of parentheses is opposite of what you see? So if this is a minus one, this would be a shift to the right one representing that, that value. A shift down five is a down five. We know that this would be a shift down five. Okay, that's what that means. This would be a shift right one. Okay, that's what that means. This is why this is called vertex form because it models your vertex perfectly in your transformations. Of course, the issue is that I need to find what that A is. Well, your first step is done. Your first step is use your vertex to fill out what you can by understanding the transformations that are taking place to get to obtain that vertex. Shift right, minus one. Shift down, minus five. Now we use this point that's given to you. Here's what this says. Your input is zero, and it gives you an output of negative three. Well, since your, your variable for your inputs is x, and your variable for your outputs is f of x, plug in your point. Don't plug in for A. This says your input is zero. So replace the X with zero. Your output is negative three. Replace the F of X with negative three. This is what this is saying to you. It's saying if you plug in zero, you should get out an output of negative three. Hey, I plugged in zero. I should get an output of negative three. And now that we have that filled out, there's only one thing that we can do. We can solve for your A. So by doing that, negative one squared is one. One times A is A. If I add five, then A is two. Come right back up here and just put that A in there and you've completed your function. That still has a vertex of, let's see, right one down five, that's here. Uh, this would still have a y intercept of 0, 3. Plug in 0 if you want to. 0 minus 1, that's negative 1 squared is 1. 1 times 2 is 2 minus 5 is negative 3. So I know that that actually works with the, the information that's given to me. And that's how to go from um, given a point, like a vertex, and a y intercept, how to find a function from it. If you need to distribute it, you can certainly do that. So you distribute this x minus 1 squared first. and then distribute your two.
and then combine like terms. And now you get a function in standard form rather than in vertex form, which either way you go, they're very graphable. You can certainly graph that. Uh, this one you find use the vertex. Well, you already had the vertex. Use the x-intercepts from. Let's see, is it factorable? Looks like it. No, no. You figure it out if it's factorable or not. Uh, negative four. Negative six. No, I'm not thinking, not seeing it there. So, but you could do it if you had to. Anyway, I hope it makes sense. I hope I've explained that well enough for you guys to understand it. Uh, and I'll see you for the next video.